Do do do. <laughs> do do do. <clears throat> Hello. Hello, how are you? Round two. Round three, yeah. How are you? Round oh, round three, I guess. Awesome. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. How about you? Oh, I'm much better now. Uh, I feel better now. See that we're all both human there. See, we took turns here. So the other day it was my turn. It was my turn. Today we're good. We got all the technical stuff out of the way. We're good now. Welcome again to the FRL headquarters podcast. I have also fixed my uh, background, as you can see. Isn't it lovely? Yes, it looks That's very lovely. Thank you. I appreciate it. Your background is also very lovely. <laughs> mm, so it's home decor that my mom decorated herself. Oh, very talented. Very talented indeed. Well, happy Friday, first and foremost. <laughs> happy Friday. It's like a holiday. It is like a holiday. So <laughs> the other day when we were um, attempting this, we, we started getting someplace and then just I couldn't get over the fact that I was all thumbs and everything else. But since then, um, we've been able to fix things and whatnot. So why don't you again... Tell the people who weren't here the other day how awesome you are and why you are who you are. Yes. Um, well, first off, I'm an actor. That's that's one of the main reasons I have all my photos and stuff in the background. Uh, yeah. Um, actually, speaking of being an actor, I did an audition today. You did? That's exciting. How yeah, was that? I did. How was uh, that? I did really good this time. I memorized it in about 30 minutes. Pretty 30 easy. minutes. 30 minutes. Now, the audition. Now, let me. I did ask you this the other day. I wanted to ask you again. Now that it's more. Now we're a little bit easier and everything is flowing solid. What is your process for getting ready for an audition? And how do you go about like figuring out what what roles to look for and so forth? What is your process for that? Everyone has their own style. Okay, so so my mom begins by she'll send me the script through uh, uh like text and then i will like look through it and i won't memorize it at that time until she gets home sure then the next thing next step so i'm pretty much i already have what i'm gonna have to expect mm -hmm. so i know what i'm gonna expect so if it's like very hard like it's paragraphs and paragraphs long i'm gonna memorize it before she gets home to an extent and then we'll go over it but the okay. way i memorize things i'm like a little different um i don't i can't memorize it by just reading it over and over again i have to work with someone and the way i do it actually is i will get the paper and we'll read it together and i'll get a kind of a thing like you know like a kind of an idea of it and then once i kind of have an idea of it i'll get a um i'll put the paper down we'll go page at a time and if it's paragraph, paragraph at a time or sentences at a time, I'll be like, um, let's say Jonathan had 400 apples. Well, if it was Jonathan had 400 apples on a Sunday morning while going to church um, and goes into detail about that, you would go sentence by sentence or page by page and kind of memorize it like that. So that's how I kind of memorize Not bad. scripts and stuff. Scripts are, you know, what's interesting about, you know, when it comes to scripts and some people are so like tight knit on that, like some, when it comes to script writing, um, I, myself, I, I write what's called an open-ended script, which is a little bit different uh, than a lot of other people. Because I, I write New York style, which is what they also call independent film versus Hollywood style, which is a little bit different. Believe it or not, there's actually different types of scripts people can write. Uh, I don't know if people, I don't know if you knew that. You probably did. You're an actor. Um, but there are basically, not, not to bore too many people with the details of how writing goes or script writing, but there's a New York style, which is kind of tight knit and kind of kind of freelance more so. It's like kind of like how you would write um, a play sort of uh, word for word. This is what the scene is, da, 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 da. Now, Hollywood style is a lot different. Hollywood style, it has to be the right margins and the things have to be in the right places and, you know, whatnot. New York style or independent films a little bit more laid back than that. 
my something. style is a little bit different than that. My style is what I call an open-ended script. So what I think makes it more natural is what I do is I give the actor, what I do is I give you the kind of the synopsis. This is what the scene is. This is kind of the bullet points I want you to hit, but I'm going to leave it up to you to come up with the actual words to use or how to, or I will leave it up to the actor to kind of reformat things because I wanted to make it look realistic because in all honesty, people have different dialects and people understand things differently. Now, how I would describe something might be different than something like yourself would. Now, if I'm writing a coming of age film, well, granted, I, I wasn't that old, wasn't that young not long ago, but it's been a little while since the 80s and the 90s when I was, you know, a 12, 13 year old person. Right. You might have lingo that kids who are 13 would understand versus what I would when I was 13, 13. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So what I when I write a script, I make it what I call open ended. So I kind of give you the bullet points because I want it to come from the actor because it makes it more real because it's your words like. If I'm going to sit there and tell someone from, you know, Ohio to say, hey, dude, what's up, man? And, you know, talk about this like surfer lingo. People in Ohio, Texas and stuff like that probably would not say dude or you know, whatever. Then again, I don't know what I, who I'm kidding. Nowadays, everyone uses dude and all those things all over again. So never mind that. <laughs> but still, you get the idea. But, you know, yeah. it's cool that you do that. Everyone had because scripts are really tough to remember because there's a lot of lines. Now, are you someone who you said you worked with someone, which is also smart, by the way. It's always good to say it out loud so you can actually get a feel for the character and the movements and, you know, get a rhythm going. That's actually really smart. So well done. Yeah. Um, well, what's that? So the thing with I have like this thing in my garage, like a whole thing just for acting. And I will have a blue like screen. Most every actor has a blue screen for their acting. Mm -hmm. And if not, for my slates, I usually do a white wall, but my mom fixed the um, garage up to where it's now not a mess because we have a roommate, but it's fine. I get it. It's cool. <laughs> I get it. Um, yeah, so we just sit there. We have like two chairs inside that area. We have two big lights. One like um, there's one here, one here. We have a ring light that we record with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, it, it's it works and we have our little areas where i will look because i i put a few nails and stuff in the wall for different cues to look at like Smart. there'll be a camera over there on the heater Very well done. and then a nail in the wall right there or a piece of tape right there it, you know it it's about more or less the who personality and where you're looking. and where you're yeah. gonna look right that's really smart because especially yeah. since like if you ever worked in like, especially if you're working on like an animated movie um, or something where you're going to be working with it, like an animation video, like an inanimate object type of thing. For example, um, movies that have like humans and cartoons in the same realm, which is cutting edge stuff. Um, a lot of the times they'll have like a tennis ball or something there for the actor who's physically there to look at. So when the computerized version comes in, that that's kind of how that works. But basically, the actor does not physically see, you know, the big scary monster in front of them because it doesn't exist because it's computerized. But the tennis ball that represents whatever that is that it's talking to, that's kind of what that is. So what you're doing there on your own realm, that's actually smart for someone who, you know, I don't know if you've done films where you're working with, um, you know, things like that, but that's actually really smart. Because it gives you an idea of where you're supposed to look and whatnot, especially not look at the camera. That's always so fun. Um, out of curiosity, so you said before you worked on a few independent films, correct? Yeah. And you also worked, worked on, on a couple other things. The Evil Within. Um, I, I'm pretty sure the school. No, that's a sag. Heaven Song. Uh, I think. Crossroads? No, not Crossroads. The WTR Cities and um, that's it, I think. It's cool. I, You're only starting. You're only yeah. just beginning. You got a lot more to go. I, I can tell that. I already know. And two of them, two of them were leads. Two of them were leads. That's a good thing. So, 
And, and now, <laughs> yeah, that's really good. Let me now let me ask you about the lead thing. Now, what do you? Obviously, everyone wants to be the guy who's in front of the camera the whole time. For you personally, do you mm -hmm. like being the person that this is about me, or do you like being the kind of the guy who everyone relies on in the background? Not the background, but you know, like the the important antagonist or the important other person who is in the film. Like, do you like to be the no, person I like, the camera's on the whole time, or do you like to be the guy who's supporting the guy? I like to be. I like to be in front of the camera. I'm kind of that. I need the attention. I like. Yeah, that. I'm like. I, I need attention. <laughs> yeah, I want uh, the camera. <laughs> okay. I want the camera. I want the camera so close I could kiss it. That's I want funny. it like at my face. That's funny. Uh, that's how yeah. you know you want that's how you know there's a passion for acting when someone has that kind of thing wants it. You know, the thing about acting now, I don't know, because you say you've been like acting what since 2021 21, you said? Is that um, what you said? I yeah, 2021. Like because See, yeah, because memory, of COVID. Right? Yeah, I got you there. Yeah. That's a lot of fun. Um but you know that's our you know you're already starting on your way and everyone kind of earns their stripes. You they, you know you make those independent films, you do a couple stand-ins somewhere, background stuff and then what'll happen is as you probably know, it'll all snowball once you get that one thing. But then what'll happen yeah. is You'll get that thing, right? And then you're like, oh, here we go. So let me ask you this. So all the people, now you've worked with some people, um, various different, you know, elements of acting skills and stuff like it. What is it like working with other people on set? Like, and who do you prefer working with on set? Now, what I mean by who do I, I'm, I'm battling off all kinds of questions for you, but let's take one <laughs> thing at a time. First and foremost, what do you like best about being on set? Let's break it down like that. Well, of course, people, the people, like the cast and crew is one of the main things. Um, I tend to get along better with more or less adults than younger people. But if I have to, I'll get along with the younger. But there's more cast and crew than small little lead roles. And, I, and you know, um, the thing about that is you have to if you're going to be stuck with like a cast and crew for 30 or 40 plus days you're gonna you're gonna have to get be friends with them so that's pretty much the main part of acting sure that's true and getting now, close <laughs> yeah, of course yeah now here's the real question now here's a now taking that question what has been some like what has been some of the best experiences you've had being on a set what is your favorite part like obviously you talked about the struggle what is your what's the best part for you being on the set like what what is a memory that says this is the most fun i've ever had well there will be on set games so we'll just make up games and there will be like so the one movie i did called um Oh yeah, it was the school duel. I was a stunt double for it, uh, the main character because it's it was it was a sad film, and we had this party that they did at the end of filming that day, mm -hmm. and we were filming in a a spring at the time, so we got to jump off the diving board into the spring, mm -hmm. and it was it was a lot of fun. So, <laughs> so our, my favorite part is more or less the game part where they had this game on set where they would get a like you know a paper clip sure and they would pen, they'd call them pens or those like c not c43s or something like that they had like on set names because right. they couldn't tell the public or something. They, would, they would have like a little clip thing and they clip it on your thing without anyone noticing and whoever got clipped they have to clip the next person it's just fun that's a group building you, you activity just, that's a group building activity that's smart that's a good yeah. idea. You know what also was good about that also is it builds a uh, unity within the unit too, within your cast and crew. It builds uh we used to call those group building exercises. And actually one of the things that I believe in heavily is before you get involved with any kind of an activity or any kind of a filming process with people, you got to be around a lot. Something a lot I like to do, and a lot of people have adopted this, is I like to encourage you know, for example, if it's a, if a coming of age film, I like to encourage the kids to hang out as much as I can 
or as much as they can, I should say, and to get that kind of a camaraderie going. Because when you're working on a film, like on television, it's important to have that continuity. So one of the things that I have been heavily involved, one of the things that I do on my sets that I've recommended other people, and other people have adopted that too, is to do like you do, have like games or have things prior to even filming so you have that kind of familiarity with each other. Because at first it's like awkward. It's like the new kids in school, right? Yeah. Everyone comes in. No one knows everyone. Everyone's coming from everywhere. Every different backgrounds, different levels of acting. But what I think is a helpful tool to have is to have that kind of process where you can get a, what I call the feeling out process, to get to know each other. Because when it comes time to filming, there's more of that laid back atmosphere. Because it's more like you're hanging out with your friends or you have that, you know, natural ability. Like, even if it's like a film that isn't a coming age movie, like, um, you know, if you're working on a film, say you're, you're the son and you're a, you have a dad or whatever in the film. And it's like a, one of those kinds of deals. I think it would be important to feel you to film, you know, film scenes with that or a mother or whatever the case may be. You know what I mean? Cause that, cause the person you're going to be working with the most on that, in that role, in that scene, you want to have that most continuity in. Uh, so that's why I always encourage people to spend and get to know the person they're going to be working off of the most, because you're going to be kind of kind of like war buddies in in the end of things. Yeah. Um, but that's a really smart that you've done group building exercises on set. That's a good way to keep also, especially if you have more than one person, it's a good way to kind of keep the morale up because that's where things can come in handy was people get tired and people are exhausted at the end of a long shooting day, you've done 700 takes of the same scene. And now everyone's yeah. like, Oh, here we go. I trust me. I've been on the other end of that. Not where you are, but I've been on the other end of that. And I know it can't be fun. Um, I've been, I've done some extra work, which, you know, for me to be in the background, what do I care? I'm getting, I'm just kind of chilling out here in the background. No big deal. But for someone who has to do take after take after take after take, that could be a grueling thing. It could put a lot of you know pressure on someone, like especially if it's an intense scene. Um, now you mentioned you know doing the doing a scene where you had to dive and stuff like that, and you're saying oh, like in a pool type of thing. Is that something you like? Those are the kind of roles you would play more into. Are they doing something more sports like, or you know? Or are you looking um, to do something more like, like, what do you look for in a script? What's something that speaks out? I want to do this in this movie. Well, I'm not, I'm, I guess I do play sports, but I'm not really the biggest sports guy because I have knee problems and stuff. But one of the main things, I get that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So probably one of the things that I would be saying that I would do is I'd probably be like, um, I'd be doing like, I'd be walking a lot, or I would be, I could run, or I could play a baseball movie, or something. I gotcha. You know, I would do something decent, like something that I can still like keep my energy level high, Understood. or like an action drama, something like that. Epic. Or sci fi. I, I will be right back. I just have an order coming. I'll be right back. Sorry about that. By the way, while we're, while we're doing this, well, I just gotta go break break real quick. Why don't you um I don't know, tell people about your fa like your top ten favorite films of all time. Okay. Right back. So top ten favorite films. Um probably around the action and adventure films. So my favorite I'll go from I'll go from ten. Um I don't Mm. All right, I'll start with Jurassic Park, um, the Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, that the new, the newest one, and then I'll go down to the Jurassic World one. That's just the Jurassic World, and then I will go to um, Journey One, um, and Journey Two. Journey One is my eighth. Oh, no, seventh, sorry. And then six is Journey 2. And then five is probably um, that the, the Star Wars uh, Clone Wars series. It, it, I 
watched it for a while. Four, weird, but Breaking Bad. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, three, probably um, Homeward Bound, uh, two, and then The Incredible Journey. I'm uh, back. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, two is probably Incredible, uh, or not Incredible Journey. Um, Homer Bound one, and then one, um, probably the Star Wars movie. The um, I forgot the name. Are you a big was, Star Wars fan? Uh, yeah, yeah. Or no, no, probably the Avengers: Infinity War. Awesome stuff. Mm -hmm. I apologize. I had to get my mail that was coming. I apologize. The life of a writer is never easy. Let me tell you everything else anyway back to you i apologize and you know what i did hear some of those picks and some great movies that's some great films right there yeah uh, some of those i also enjoy um out of curiosity so are those roles the ones you mentioned all of those movies which of those roles do you think you would have loved to have had a chance to be in if you could have and why okay, so a big one would probably be the journey, one of the journey series, um, journey two probably, because Rock. I always made it a goal to meet the Rock. Don't know why. <laughs> Wayne Johnson, the Rock. Yeah, yeah. We went no. over this the other day. Okay, cool. That was yeah. all right. I wanted to say this, but I didn't want to interrupt you about the casting. Yeah, go ahead. My favorite like cast out of the cast that I filmed with mm -hmm. is um backstage. They do commercials with Disney and Universal. Okay. There's, we know them really well, and we've made really good friends with them. That's my favorite cast and crew, and the school duel. That's awesome. You know what, though? I get that, especially if you're going to be, I mean, Disney is in general. Um, I've heard good things about people who like to kind of pal around from the Disney world and that kind of thing there, and it makes a sense. Um, it sounds... It, I think it's important when you have that niche and you have those people you get along with, that's where you're going to feel the most comfortable with. Um, so I get that. And that makes sense. And especially since that kind of crew is kind of have a reputation for having that kind of a family like atmosphere. And that's cool. Um, you know, one of the things that um, I know that a lot of young actors struggle with or actors in general struggle with more so young actors is the connection piece as far as like this is actually a big thing not a big thing but like you being you said we'll say 13 the average 13 year old might not have the ambition to do what you're doing they might not have the work ethic that you have they might not even like why do you want to do this and whatever what have you and what will happen is there's two kinds of people right there's the people who are like that's awesome right and they're supportive. And then there's the ones who are like, why are you doing that? Right. So go ahead. Well, I can explain why. I um, can't wait. <laughs> it might be a little long, but it's a little bit as of long a as your, As long as your cameras, as long as your phone's all, all, all level, we're good on this end. I got a computer this time. Oh, cool. I so do I. It. And I have my favorite computer, which is why everything's working all hunky dory now. So we're in good standards. So, by all means, tell us why. Okay, so I had a pretty rough past, including uh, bullying and a whole bunch of other stuff I'm not going to go through right now. Um, but yeah, I went through some bullying for five, six years. Um, and you, it was one of those situations, those corny situations, I'm going to prove them wrong. I'm, I'm going to get famous and I'm going to be the most successful out of the class and it's just going to be like you know i had the dream and i was going to make it work that's that's how i was like so uh i was just thinking you know it was just a small idea like you know i told you it was modeling at first and then i thought hey why don't i be an actor and then and then it kind of progressed and now i'm in like nine ten movies and and it's just you know it's it's working out and, okay. you know, the funny thing is, I got paper right here with all the movies and stuff. Um, all of these movies haven't came out yet. None of them. Awesome. Uh, the highlighted ones I filmed, I've uh, got the ones I filmed for, they're highlighted. Um, am I allowed to say all of them? 
<laughs> I don't want to get have sued to or say, anything by you don't have to say any, you don't I don't want to get sued by the SAG films. So I probably you don't have to say anything about those. You can just tell us, you know, what your experience was, which ones you're excited about. You don't have to even tell us what the movie is if you don't want. Okay, so the ones about what I you can... feel comfortable about. Yeah. That's all. So I feel like I can say these because um, this one has a website. So it's called Tech It. WTR Cities, School Duel, um, and probably the Mr. Watson one. Uh, Heaven Song is iffy, but yeah, probably. Cool. Epic. Yeah. Excited. I'm excited, I'm excited for you. And you know what I like the most about your presentation? Well, not your presentation, but your explanation is you don't know. I know I, this story you just said, I've heard so many times. And you know what my favorite part about it is? I've actually seen people do exactly what you're do, what you're saying you're going to do. And guess what? At the end of the day, guess what? You what? have how many movies highlighted on that page? One, two, three, four, five, six. I can and almost guarantee you anyone one, who's two, bullied, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine movies. Nine movies he's got highlighted that you're actually and going to either be in or have already filmed, right? Two leads. Yeah, two leads. Okay, so two leads. So to any of the bullies out there in the world, you've already won. You what are they doing so wonderful in their life? Um probably not much of anything except for wreaking havoc and doing much of nothing. Uh, like the average... I'm so miserable. I can't. I can't pass my grades in class. I have repeated a grade. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I I am a bit, I don't know if you knew this, but I, I can't stand bullies. And mm -hmm. <laughs> I do a lot of work for anti-bullying stuff. My first film that I wrote was an anti-bullying film, um, mm -hmm. which was based on a song that I wrote, which I performed live in front of people in 2001, about a month That's after 9-11. older than me. Yeah, but, I know, right? But actually, um, one of the movies that uh, I'm filming in is actually trying to get rid of uh, bullying, too. It's like a bullying film. It was a school duel, I believe. Awesome. I am in full support of anything that's going to put it into bullying. Um, my regular nine-to-five job is I go to schools and I talk to kids about bullying and how to prevent it and why the grass isn't always greener on the other side and so forth, because... Now I got to be clear. I'm I have never been bullied, but I've seen people be bullied, and I took a, I learned a long time ago. I'm not going to be someone who's going to sit there and watch it happen. And I became proactive versus just sit around and watch it because I know that happens a lot. Which is why when I do my presentations, I go to schools and stuff, and I tell people, listen, bullies aren't dumb. They're going to wait till no one's there. I mean, I know all there's all kinds of those old tropes: sticks and stones will break your bones, and you know, all of those things that, you know, people used to say that none of them ever work together today or not ever. Um, as I had told you before, you know, my ambition growing up was to be a pro wrestler. And I was short. I was skinny. I was poor. <laughs> I came from a town that nobody cared about. And people in my family never thought that any of it was anything big. Um, and people love to doubt me. Um, my favorite thing was when my step family or people in general said I was never going to graduate high school because I was not smart enough or good enough to do so. So from seventh grade to 12th grade, simultaneously back to back, I was either on the honor roll or high honor roll every semester. And when I graduated high school, I graduated high school with honors, 14th in class, because my last name has an S in it. National Honor Society, while being on the sports teams, having um, a couple scholarships that I was awarded, and I still graduated high school with honors. What did I do to get back of those people who, who said, you're not going to do this, and they talked down to me and all these things? I invited them to my high school graduation because I had to do a presentation, and they had to sit there with the rest of the town and everyone else there when they read that graduating... 14th in class, National Honor Society, yours truly. And they'd have to sit there like everyone else and listen to everyone else cheer while they sat there. They didn't show up, of course. But just the sensation of the feeling that I proved them right. Because something that I love more than anything is when people doubt me. You know what I mean? 
So all those people who said, you know, gave you a hard time before, I can't wait till these movies get out because you know what? I'm going to plug the heck out of them when they come out so people can go see the great Kane in action. So all those bullies can, you know, have their mom and dad give them money so they can see you doing what you do best. That's what I say about that. What do you think of that? I think that's really, uh, you know, that that's a really good um, comparison to what's going on with a whole bunch of people that are going through bullying. And, you know, it's a really good comparison to a lot of things, including acting, you know. Yeah, I think a lot of people forget how much how powerful words are and how important our roles are. And they forget kind of what gifts we are given. And when I was growing, when I, when I, here comes that old thing again, when I was, I started, I started training in martial arts when I was four, my grandmother thought it would be good for me because we lived in a rough area. So my, I got into martial arts at four. I started doing tournaments at five. And I remember back then in the eighties, we're talking, people didn't talk about doing martial arts or any of these things, but I was always confident in myself because on a mat, I was somebody, the people in the, my, my dope, my sensei, the dojo that I belong to my, my fellow people I trained with the people who I competed against up and down the East coast of the United States in those regional tournaments up and down, I grew to earn their respect because I put my work ethic in. And again, I was short, skinny until that belt, that whistle blew and then you found out how quick and tough I actually was now that being said but my get my passion if you would my my kind of moment was when I went to my first live wrestling show and I was six now I ask I bring this up because I'm going to ask you another question around this and it's kind of that awakening that aha moment if you would yeah. My moment when I when I was six, sitting there at a live wrestling show, was when I decided this is what I'm going to do. Because I mean, at six, how many people have a goal or aspirations to do anything at six? I mean, but I, I want to be a firefighter or astronaut, but you know, that's every kid. Right, every kid, right? Or but I want to be an elephant. And at six, uh, I would love to be an elephant. Let me tell you. If it is six, I I was already, you know, doing stuff in the martial art world because I was already doing the tournament stuff at five and I was already training hard there. But also I started writing, believe it or not, at six and seven. I remember writing my first song, which, by the way, was oh, <laughs> my first song I ever wrote the lyrics to was in first grade. I was seven years old, maybe. No, six and seven. I was when I first wrote my first actual song with lyrics which was awful by the way <laughs> i was six or seven though in in claire it was called thank you mother goose i was seven but in retrospect my aha moment was sitting there live at this wrestling show and feeling the energy from the crowd around i was six i was tiny anyway but it wasn't the main event that made me want to become a pro wrestler it was that first match on the card that no one cares about normally, it was between two people, as my uncle said, the two nobodies who participated. One of them, I mean, I'm not going to say the name. You don't know. I don't know how much about wrestling you know, but one of them was named um, Steve Lombardi, who would go on to become the Brooklyn Brawler. The other one was Leaping Lanny Poffo, who, by the way, did poetry as part of his gimmick at that time. Gimmick is what you call a persona of a wrestler, like the rock his gimmick was to be the people's champion. That's his gimmick. The big book. Raw. Guy. Yeah, the rock. Yeah, I know the rock. I know Dwayne Johnson very well. He's a really cool guy. Um, hopefully you do get to meet him eventually because <laughs> he is quite interesting. I've been fortunate enough to work with some of the best um, and know some of the awesome people in the world. But um, all that comes with a thing. But in in retrospect... That first match, watching these two guys have control of this audience, this live audience. Now, when you talked about, you know, doing a live thing before, that's why I say I know what it's like to go live. Because when you're a pro wrestler, that's all you have. There's no safety net. You're in front of all of those people. In all honesty, a lot less, you know, in a, in a very much of a different dress than everybody else is, so to speak. If you ever watched pro wrestling, if you watch The Rock, 
you know, that, that sense of confidence you have to have or self-confidence, I should say, to go out there and go out in the rock attire. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but not everybody has that. I had the confidence to go on a ring and, and not a ring, but I had the confidence to go on to a martial art mat and all those things. But to feel that energy these two guys were getting, and I remembered that the the good guy lost, of all things, but it was the storytelling they told in the ring and how they controlled the audience. That was when I said, I'm going to do that. I told that to my uncle at six. And my uncle, who's a wrestling fan, said, yeah, we'll see about that, little guy. <laughs> and six months before I graduated high school, I started wrestling school. Now, granted, I was given scholarships. Like I said, I was given scholarships in high school. I was pretty smart. I did wrestling in, in high school. I also did soccer, football to the world audience. And I also did, I was also on the swim team. I was a lot different than I am now, obviously. Definitely not in the size I was in high school and now that I am now. But my first passion was to become a pro wrestler. And everyone who doubted me, my uncle, who was a huge wrestling fan, you're too small and skinny and that doesn't work. I went to wrestling school, the same wrestling school as guys like, I don't know, John Cena, Triple H. I don't know if you ever heard of that guy or China, uh, half a dozen other people. And I went in there six months before I graduated high school. I still graduated high school with honors, committed to full-time wrestling school, graduated from that wrestling school, was signed to my first wrestling contract at 19 years old. And worked for old school ECW and Paul Heyman. So that was how my journey started. So the moral of that story is that my aha moment started back in 1986 at a live show. For you, what was your aha moment when you decided, I want to do that? Meaning acting. Uh, probably like two months after I got like beat up by like a whole bunch of people. Uh, I kind of just like, you know, thought, hey, why not? Um, you know, it might not like seem like it's gonna be unrealistic, but you know, I can make it happen. I've got the looks, I've got the personality, I can do this. That's what I that's that's kind of what pretty much happened. <laughs> yeah. First and foremost, I'm sorry that happened to you. <laughs> oh no, no, it's fine. I don't really But but I'm proud of you that you're able to continue yourself and you're able to also keep working towards it because that's important and i think more so we're going to make sure you're going to succeed because that's awful no one deserves to ever be treated unfairly or bullied um in all honesty i mean i don't know how many times i've talked about bullying on this show alone i've probably talked about bullying more so than people care to hear but all honesty it's something that continues to happen so my goal is until it's no longer a thing, I have to continue doing what I'm doing. So if I'm, if I'm going to have amazing people like yourself who are a beacon of hope to all those other people, because guess what? Sad to say, you're not the only one who's gone through that. But also, you're not going to be you're going to be one of the many people who succeed to in order to kind of give that old uh, hmm, salute, if you would, to all those people who doubted and were bullies at one point because i'll tell you there's no better feeling to know that you at the end of the day won and at the end of the day you've earned the bragging rights to say that i did it the fact that you've already been in films is already more so than any of those people can ever say you've yeah. already accomplished more than most 13 year olds do in 13 years most kids can't even take their trash out or tie their shoes and you're booking gigs and and working for disney right yeah <laughs> i know right my corniness but it's true you yeah, know you're right no i know it's not just the corny part <laughs> it's <laughs> not just the corny it's part true. not just the corny part no in all reality you're right um i feel like i could i could keep going and i can make it now, yeah, I'm probably going to have to graduate and still get a college degree, but I could I could still act while getting a college degree. And if I make it before I need to get a college degree and I'm set, I guess I'll be on set. <laughs> um, a lot of people have done that, and there's nothing wrong with that anyway either. Um, how do you like school? Do you like school? 
Uh, what is your yeah. explain uh, that? That's actually a question I normally ask everybody who comes on the show: is what your school experience is. How? What are you doing for school right now? Are you homeschool? Do you go to public school, private school? Okay, so I go to private school, and um, you know, I as much as I really wanted to work out, I still have, I have this saying that me and my grandpa made up. Uh, you have the cake and then you have the icing and then you have the fondant or the fondant or the cake fondant and the nice icing. So pretty much you've got your cake, which is your base layer, your thing that you think is going to happen the most and is going to be a guarantee happen if the other thing doesn't work. The fondant is like a backup if, the uh, cake doesn't work, or if the fondant works, you pretty much just, you know, you stick with that. And then you have your icing on the cake. The icing is like the backup of the backup. Um, pretty much the, um, but the fondant's the acting. And I, my set is pretty much, I skipped a grade in school and I'm gonna get a degree in Emory Riddle. Um, and I feel my grandpa is, very focused on my schooling because the fact that I get straight A's all the t like every year I just got a B my first B my school is weird by what, what, cl what class did you get a B in <laughs> language arts oh okay that's okay we'll, we'll, we'll pass you on that yeah language arts is weird they add like w new words every B day. is still on a roll by the way yeah yeah so yeah. I mean I get a sticker for straight A's, so it's not really <laughs> a sticker. A sticker. Good for so you. It's not really that. Yeah, yeah. I got a A plus. Slap a sticker on my forehead and go. Well, you know. Um, <laughs> and then the icing on the cake is well. I guess I'm gonna just get a job at McDonald's and just you know be miserable for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> that depends on how well you make that that role work. I mean. Are you <laughs> McDonald's? I think when it comes to jobs, and I think when it comes to a level of success, I think it depends on how we look at things. I, I always like to think that always you should have a plan A, B, and C. For me, I wanted one thing, but then I also had other things I was interested in. I also loved writing. I also loved to help people. So when I, so what happens, especially in my life, see acting is a, and one good thing about acting for the most part is there's limited ways you can get injured, if you would. But in the same sense, what is interesting is the entertainment industry and the wrestling industry have one thing in common. And TV. that is, it's tough on your body and it's tough on your. And films um, and TV. It, you get famous from it. Yeah. Well, there's actually a lot of things. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of things there. But the other part about it is the wear and tear it does on your body and then the after effects, right? And yeah. what I was fortunate enough to know is I had other things I was passionate about. And I my first goal was to be a pro wrestler as much as I could have. I mean, I had my, my last tournament when I was 18 years old. That was my last martial art tournament. I got my black belt, whoopee. Yeah. But that wasn't my ambition. I wanted to become a pro wrestler. So I, you know, stopped doing the martial arts and I focused on pro wrestling while I was going to regular high school. But in high school, I was fortunate enough that I was also working other things. I, I was a writer by high school. I was writing a short story series. <laughs> I was writing a short story series. It was pretty popular with people um, in the school anyway. And I was also writing other things, but I was also dabbling in my school. I was fortunate enough to had a human services department where I was learning some basics to high to sociology and psychology. And I got certified in first aid and CPR at age 16 because that was important to me, more so than getting a driver's license because I wanted to know how I could help someone versus not. Because like yourself, um, I've had to overcome a lot of things too, and I don't want to be in a situation where I can't help someone if and that's in the case. But moral of that story is in 2003, my probably my best year in pro wrestling, I was in one of the big major wrestling magazines and getting the golden microphone for my speaking ability in wrestling. 
Um, I was wor- I've already worked with several of the companies at that point. I worked with some of the best talent who I'm still friends with to this day. And then in 2003, I got injured. I got my knee blown out and I was out of wrestling for three years. <laughs> so some people might be like, oh, now what? But I had a backup. I had other things I could do. So fortunately, I still had those scholarships. If you remember, I had. I was able to activate those and go to what I called regular school. And I earned two college degrees in the time that I was in there. So that's how I got a degree in film and human services. Yeah, my mom, my mom likes to help people too. She, um, for her, driving actually did help. Um, she's literally saved countless lives. Um, she was a, she almost hit, hit like Olympic level swimmer when she was younger. Awesome. Um, the problem is her back kind of got thrown out and her coach got arrested. Oh, that's awesome. So um, she kind of just calmed down, but that helped her be um, really good at, she she worked at this resort called Hammock Beach and she got like some type of award. What was the award called? Life Saving Award by Forbes Magazine. The Forbes Magazine Life Saving Awesome. Oh. She saved a life that was in the ocean drowning from something. <laughs> Rip current. That uh, she swam out there in her work clothes, by the way. Yeah. Um, she was an off. <laughs> she was an off. <laughs> and she, she, she swam out there, saved the person, did CPR, saved their life. She got awards and stuff. And she, I can't, um, I can't count how many times she pulled over on the side of the road and saved people out of fires. That's awesome. Um, because she was, she was a police officer, a firefighter, an EMT, and something else. I don't remember the last thing. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Might as well just gone in the military to finish it all. <laughs> My wife was in the military. She would have uh, did good. That's yeah. awesome. Uh, I can relate to your mom. Uh, a lot of the way, a lot of those things you described, I've had to put myself into places because I don't want to be in the space where I can't help someone, and and. You know, that's a scary situation to be in, but it's also one of those things you don't really think about it. You just know the instincts to get involved. Like when I was watching people be bullied, I would be the one to step in. And then, um, you know, things like in 2013, for example, where I'm from, I was working for a day program. um, And while, you know, we went to this race that they have up my neck of the woods all the time. And unfortunately this day was a dark day for that that race and i was about a block away from where something pretty bad happened while we made sure everyone was safe in our group i went to see who i if i could help anyone where the where the things went off and uh that's just the instincts that i have so i know how that i i can almost i can relate to your mom in that sense there's sometimes you have that impulse. You don't think twice. You just act. And that's kind of what happened there. After I made sure everyone I was with was safe, I went towards where the things went off and I want to make sure everyone was, I could help in some way. And uh, so I get how that works. Uh, and I pre- tell your mom, I appreciate what she does and what she did. And that's a, that's something that a lot of people would do. And that's something that I'm sure you're proud of that you have a, a wife, oh, not wife, you have a mother who is like <laughs> our, my, my wife, a real life Wonder Woman. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, my mom looks like Wonder Woman. She's jacked and looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger. There you go. She's just not German. So, you know. Austrian. Oh, Arnold. She got the, the uh, guns. Yeah. She got... <laughs> One of our old jokes were, I don't know if you ever heard of John Cena. He's a guy that I, I used to work in the gym with. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. You you met him? I worked with him a long time. Me and him started wrestling at the same time. So back in the day, John Cena's from my neck of the woods. <laughs> but what's funny about him is he wasn't originally wanting to be, a, he didn't want to be a wrestler originally. He wanted to be a bodybuilder. And actually, one of the fun things that we used to talk a lot about is how he got over that. Because believe it or not, do you know that John Cena used to be very self-conscious? And so much so that 
when he went to his goal was to become a bodybuilder because we all would work out in the gym and lift weights. We, we were called gym rats back in the day. They still call them that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that okay, I'm glad that some people still use that. Well, he went, his goal was to want to be a bodybuilder, but he was a little, still not completely uh, comfortable with the whole bodybuilding, you know, presentation. So his coach at that time out in California he would tell us the story about how his coach had him sit, sit, do his routines in the bodybuilding attire in the middle, in front of the busiest intersection of California. And that's how he got over his kind of self-conscious thing. Um, so it's all about overcoming those obstacles to get what you did. Cause I mean, that w- would be lead him into, you know, becoming, you know, that, but, Bodybuilding didn't work out. He came back to wrestling, went to another wrestling school. No big deal, but um, very nice guy. Um, and generally, uh, you know, I still talk to his dad quite a bit. His dad's a pretty big deal up my neck of the woods. In fact, his dad I'm going to be working with not long from now. Uh, but it's cool stuff. His dad's a promoter up in my neck of the woods. And um, in 2024, when Jazz Fitness returns, so, you know, his dad's one of the people that are going to help jazz fitness come back. So that's exciting. But in retrospect, yes, I know John Cena and, and multiple other people, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it. But that actually was going to lead me to another question I had for you. The people you've worked with already, um, you know, I'm sure they're all really cool people. Have you ever worked with someone that you're like, oh my goodness, I'm working with so-and-so? Or mm-hmm. the other part of it is, what how are you with working with like a big like name are you someone who like oh my goodness it's so and so or you're like oh hey how are you well yes and no so i worked with oh my gosh i'm acting with so-and-so's son yeah um have you ever heard like the live action movie of hercules like that yeah. The, yeah. the they were fighting something kevin sorbo i met him i met you, him. Met, you met kevin sorbo I've been to in his movies, yeah. Okay. Well, and the I... director of the movie with yeah. Dominic. Dominic something. Let me look actually, let me look at the movies he's been in. I know Kevin yeah. Sorbo. I met Kevin Sorbo. Has... Kevin Sorbo's a good guy. Uh, some he, he, how did you like work with Kevin Sorbo? Uh Dominic G- Gianetti. Oh okay. that director. That guy, cool. or I'll show you. I'll tell you some like two or three of the movies he's been in. That's a okay. religious movie. That, it, that's it's more of a. Is that more of a like a lifetime type of thing or a hallmark type of thing? What Hercules? No, no, not Hercules. Uh, that I know that that a lot of the things nowadays JC films. that JC, so- JC films. Yeah. Okay. All cool. right. Have you ever heard of Heartbreakers? What is it? Um, Random Hearts. Mm-hmm. Heartbreakers, uh, any given Sunday, <laughs> random hearts. There's something, and then it just yeah. something about Mary. There's something about Mary. Oh, of course. Have you ever heard of any of those? Uh, of course. Yeah. I hope I know some of those. Something about yeah, Mary was those, filmed up my neck the, of the woods. I might lose. You. I might lose you. My internet's like. Um, but yeah, my dinner's almost ready, so I might have to go anyway. Ah, cool. Well, we're oh, almost done. I hope. I'm having fun here. <laughs> I'm glad you're having fun. But you're doing good. I hope you're having fun. You, yeah, you're not nervous good. now, are you? You're good now? No, no, no. I'm, I'm kind of just settled in now. You're good. Um, well, you know, I want to say thank, say thank you for coming on the show first and foremost, and oh, uh, again coming you. on the show much better than thank the last you for time. Inviting and me. it's been a pleasure having you on. Always welcome here. And you are always welcome here. Um, and I hope that you're going to have awesome success. And I believe you will. So before I let you go, I like to let people have the opportunity to say whatever they need to say, plug whoever they need to say, shout out whoever they need to say and whatnot. So for that, I'm going to turn that back over to you and let you um, tell people where they can find you, what, you know, and, you know, whatnot, and any special message you want to have for people. Tag, oh, um... you're in. My Instagram is actor Kane, uh, all lowercase, um, cool. actor underscore Kane, um, K A N E. 
I, I'm pretty sure you would probably uh see that by name my names in here um mm -hmm. but yeah that's i pretty much that's it that's all my credits and if you want to you can follow my tiktok um for all the all right this Ooh, that looks like the sun right light all right yeah uh p-r-e-a-c-h-e-d-3 that's it there's no cap there's no caps it's uh, all lowercase. I made my um, profile picture myself. Find me on IMBD. Find me on IMBD. Kane Lowry. Just how you spell it. Capital K, capital L L O W R Y, and K A N E. Awesome. That's One last question before I let you go. Do you like pro oh, wrestling? Uh, I haven't really been into it, but I yeah no not really. I'm not. I I yeah. I mean. There's been some funny moments I've seen, but I was just curious. I'm, I'm I was just curious because I know you know you said you mentioned The Rock and people like John Cena, and I know they've done acting too, so that's yeah, a possibility. You know them from they're that. They're huge actors now. They're huge. They're both huge actors now. So is Dave Batista. He's another good friend of mine, or as I used to know him as Lazarus. Actually, funny story. Then I'll let you go. One of my favorite matches that I had early in my career. It was we were doing a cross promotion with. Um, ECW and uh, Ohio Valley Wrestling, which is where John Cena and some other people trained. And the tag team match was me and a, a, or Jazz Vengeance at that time, the six foot, 210 pound man, myth and legend, Jazz Vengeance, don't be afraid, be terrified. It would be me versus and a guy named Lazarus, which was, by the way, Dave Batista. He would go on to become Dave Batista. Back then it was Lazarus versus the prototype. And Randall Orton Jr., the prototype is who John Cena would become. And Randall Orton Jr. is now who Randy Orton is now. And that was like one of my early like mid-tag team matches that I had early in my career. So fun story is I teamed with Dave Batista to take on John Cena early in my career. So that was a fun little tidbit. So there you go. Dave All Batista, right. you might know from Guardians of the Galaxy. He was in that. <laughs> the big buff guy? Yeah. The, Drax, um, I believe Drax, his name yeah, was. Okay, yeah. yeah. I, I was wondering, like, there's only, like, one guy he could be that was pro wrestling. Yeah. There's a bunch of those. But, yeah, it's cool. But, anyway, thank you again for joining us. You well, did amazing, you as always. You're always welcome here. And I wish you both about the best success possible. I know you're going to rock it. And uh, next time I see my friend Dwayne, I'm going to have to pass along your name and tell him that you're looking for him. All right. All right. You have a great night. May all your dreams come true. You be safe and keep up the great work, brother. All righty. Bye-bye. Peace. All right, folks. Now it's just me again. Yep. Me. Possibly me. Um. First and foremost, again, I want to say thank you to Kane uh, for joining us and being so open and talking about his experience. Um, what I find interesting about this, he, he's an amazing, resilient young man. I mean, he has had some issues with the bullying and stuff like that, which, no, I didn't know that. But you know what's interesting is what I think he, what I think is amazing is the fact that he reminds us all and he actually reminds me of something that I believe in and the best revenge or the best kind of um, getting back at those who, who are, you know, bullies or the people who try to hold us down is to succeed. And what I was trying to point out to him, hopefully understood is that he has already proven that he is, far more talented and has more work ethic than any of those bullies who are probably going to do much of nothing. Cause all honesty, when your focus in life is just to make others miserable, that means that you have way too much time in your hands and that you have no actual work ethic or any kind of drive. Because if your goal in life is just to make others miserable First and foremost, it's a very short-lived 
um, mission, if you would. But the best part about it is that there's people like myself who people said, you're too small, you're too skinny, you're too short, you're too, you know, poor or whatnot. But guess what? I overcame that to achieve what I did. Kane, this young man right here, he is going to succeed also. He is going to be a big act time actor. And I'm sure Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, if he heard Kane's story, I'm sure Kane, I, I'm sure knowing Dwayne as well as I think I do, or well as I do, I'm sure that Kate, Dwayne would also agree that this young man is phenomenal and doing a great job. And I say sticking it to those bullies and acting as a reminder. My favorite part about when people succeed in their goals, when they are bullied, is when they succeed, the bullies have nothing left. And it also, it shows how pathetic the bullies are in the world. Um, because while those bullies are so focused on making other people miserable, here's this young man who was you know, picked on, who overcomes that to work with some great actors and become go on to a great, profound acting career. This young man is a very resilient young man, and he has a great legacy he's going about to become. His mom sounds like a real-life Wonder Woman. My wife is also a real-life Wonder Woman. And what I find amazing is that there's these real-life dream masters in the world and dream warriors in the world. Kane is a young man who has ambition, drive, determination, a dream. America is built on dreams. And when you have someone who has a work ethic and willing to put the work in, guess what? Those dreams come true. And there's a difference between saying what you want to do in life and then doing what you want to do in life. And I love when people who, you know, are seen as underdogs or seen as, you know, bullying aspects or whatever, I love to see them succeed even more so than anybody else. Because it works in two ways. One, it reinforces their own belief in themselves. And let me tell you, that young man has a personality. He has something that cannot be taught. And I'm going to tell you what that is. I would have loved to have told him. But, you know, I know that he was, um, you know, timing and so forth. But I, I'm hoping he's still listening. I hope he hears this and hope he sees this. Because what Cain has is something that cannot be taught in any acting class. And it is something that cannot be learned in any kind of a workshop. What he has is something that is natural. And this is something that, to me, is something I look in people that separates them from many other people. Cain has it. And that aspect is he has natural charisma. For those people who are not familiar, what charisma is, is the ability to hold attention, to stand apart from everyone else. Charisma is... Having the belief in yourself and being comfortable around yourself and confident in yourself. And he's a remarkable young man. He has the charisma, the jokes that he makes, the interactions that he has, how he talks about the various things so naturally. That is charisma. That's something you can't learn. I'm going to give you an example for those people who watched the video presentation 
of this, how naturally is talking about and remembering certain elements of um, what I call uh, scenarios and so forth. And, um, you know, metaphors are fantastic. And I don't know how many times I've had people on the show and I've never heard someone use metaphors like Kane does. I use metaphors a lot, if you guys haven't noticed. In all honesty, I use metaphors because they're easy for people to understand uh, points that I'm trying to make. Kane does it naturally. He remembers these very important life lessons that are used in in, um, in metaphors. I'll give you an example. He talked about the, you know, the layers of the cake, so to speak. That is a metaphor. In an out, and that is something I use a lot of those myself. For example, when I explain a scenario or I say a certain relevance, um, you know, it's interesting. A great example of it is a real life story for me when I was younger, when I was literally learning how to ride a horse. I literally got thrown off a horse, and my uncle at that time told me that if I chose to get back on the horse, then you would reclaim your, your, you know, your composure and you would show that the horse that you were in charge and that you're not, you know, afraid, or I could choose to stay off the horse and give the horse the win for the day. And I chose to get back on the horse and the horse never threw me off again. That's a metaphor. That story is a real life scenario that I use as a metaphor. You've heard before, you know, the horse, if you get thrown off a horse to get back on, you stay down. It's Or, you know, the, the real life way how to tell a real friend versus a fake one. Real friends don't kick you when you're down. They help you up. That is a metaphor that helps people figure out what a real friend is. Now, in that sense, right, what is a real friend? Real friends, they'll kick me down, they help you up, right? What that translates into, right, is your real friends, the people who are actually there for you, the people who are going to be there to help you up. They're going to, when you fall at your lowest point, they're going to be the ones to extend their hands to pick you up off the ground. Now, that's a visual, right? Because that's easy to see. But that means so many things. Because sometimes we fall down in real life. Sometimes we have struggles. But it's our real friends who will reach out without us having to ask. And will say, hey, do you need help? And they don't judge you. And they don't pressure you to do things. They want to what's best for you. Not for them, themselves, but for you. The old longer version of real friends don't help don't kick you when you're down, they help you up goes back to the song that I wrote, Real Friends Don't Kick You When You're Down. And the more of that lyric is real friends don't kick when you're down, they help you up. They brush you off and get you ready for another day. That's the lyrics, the rest of the lyrics to that song that I also wrote. But what that means is, you know. You might have a hard time, but it's your real friends who are going to get you through those hard times at your darkest days, at your hardest times. And that's when your real friends will still be there for you. You're, when life gets hard and everything gets complicated, the ones who are not your real friends, they'll be quick to run and hide and they won't be there. They'll be quick to shoot down your thing and just say, accept your defeat. But your real friends, your real friends are the ones who are right there with you side by side. We wish nothing but the best for Kane, and we hope he comes back to, to show how successful he is. And I'm going to tell you this, he's already successful more so than any of those bullies right now. Because guess what? Kane was on the F-Roll Headquarters podcast. Not any of those bullies are ever welcome on this podcast. We don't condone, we don't welcome, we don't invite bullies to this podcast. 
we write we invite real life dream masters real life people who work on goals and achieve things in life we invite people who work and continue to work to become better individuals for whatever their goals are whether it be entertainment sports music whatnot those are the people we welcome to this show who live the f4l way love caring compassion understanding respect for each other's differences the f4l way i hope kane knows that he is welcomed into the f4l and i hope he knows that whenever chips are down and whenever things get rough we'll be here and to his support system and everyone else, great job. He's doing great. Can rec- and I continue offering my support in you guys. And I believe in Kane. I believe in everybody. I believe anyone is capable of achieving whatever goals and dreams they have. And I will lend my voice any day of the week when it comes to helping others achieve what they can. This young man is going to be a success story. He's going to be another person who's going to silence the critics, silence the bullies. And I want to say his mom did a great job. Um, I'm not familiar with, I didn't really get into this personal life because I don't think that's, professional to talk about you know everything like that but what i love to hear is how supportive his family is and how important the different elements everyone is how intelligent they all are his grandpa using metaphors him understanding the metaphors his mom a real life wonder woman if they're not a success story then i don't know what is and if they are not f4l then i don't know what epitome of an f4l is This young man is going to do big things in the entertainment world. And I can't wait till he succeeds even more. Sometimes in Hollywood, it's a tough business. Um, I myself have learned about the film business. There are good experiences, there are sad experiences, there are eye-opening experiences, but at the end of the day, the important thing is to take something away from everything you do in life. Take some type of learning lesson, because that's what makes us better and stronger as a goal or whatnot. Myself, we've talked before about people I've allowed on set or bringing people on or... um, trusting or in 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 borrowing empowering other people be part of something that i worked on and that comes with a life of lessons right but you know what as much as those things were disappointments those are gifts that i get to learn from that i can transport and i can explain to others to help them avoid those things now Going back to something I started originally, now I'm on video. I don't sh- I don't hide. It came to my attention um, yesterday when I was reaching out to someone who I used to have a very reduced relationship with. Apparently, someone or people are going and they have multiple accounts of me. Well, I want you to look at my face. I want you to look at me and listen to me directly when I tell you. There is only a handful of places you can find me. You can find me on my Instagram at F4L Icon, S E A N J A Z S T E V E N S 1. That's my only Instagram. It is linked to my only Facebook account. Hold on. I've never even told you guys my Facebook account. I'll tell you my Facebook account because. We're going to clear this up right now. I want you to look at my face. Okay. And get this straight. All right. Cool. Cool. So 
because I never look at my page. I am Sean, J Sean Stevens and Sean Jazz Stevens in the description. The F world icon, Sean Jazz Stevens, is my name on Facebook. And in the pictures of me is my me and my family, my daughter, my wife, my son. In my profile picture, it is, again, from our wedding that we had from years ago. That is my only Facebook account. Now, granted, I have pages, uh, Jazz Fitness and, you know, the F4L things that I'm associated with, whatever. And then on Instagram, I've already gone over this. I know I've said it. I guess I got to say it again. My only account is F4L Icon, S E A N J A Double Z S T E V E N S 1, Sean Jazz Stevens, public figure, public professional wrestler, YouTuber, podcaster, writer, filmmaker, comedian, public speaker, anti bullying advocate, leader of the F4L, MMA athlete, and a family man. That is who I am. And you can also find my official links on that Instagram, by the way. And as far as that goes, let's chat about my YouTube real quick. Which, by the way, if you're listening to this right now, clearly you know what my YouTube channel is. The only official YouTube channel that I have, get ready for this, is Icons of the F4L. That's Icons of F4L. 444, uh, if you're looking at the at thing. And that is my official YouTube channel for this podcast, Icons of the F4L, and maybe possibly something new coming up this year. And the other channel, if you would, that I have on Instagram, I'm sorry, on, <coughs> excuse me, on uh, YouTube is get ready for this because he returns this year. <clears throat> it's life hacks from the fitness center from the jazz fit from yeah life hacks from the fitness center with jazz fitness. That's me, my wrestling character, and that will be coming back soon as you'll see some new. Jazz Fitness promos getting ready for my return this year to pro wrestling. Those are my only things. I am not on X or Twitter or anything like that. I had one. I do not use it any longer. No use of it. I don't have TikTok. I don't have Snapchat. I don't have, uh, what was the other thing? Telegram or anything like that. Listen, I can barely operate the things that I already have, which is Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and of course, this podcast, which is heard anywhere that a podcast is. Outside of that, this is it. This is who I am. This is where I am. Anyone who tries to pretend to be me, you must have. Some... I'm telling you, you are... <laughs> I would, I would think you would want to pick someone a lot easier to be than me. Um, but apparently, regardless, anyone who's listening right now and, uh, you know, I could choose to get upset uh, about the misunderstanding. But you know what? I don't because I understand how frustrating that is. Unfortunately, this is not my first time hearing about someone trying to be me. But I want to let people know this is who I am. And I have said it time and time again. If you have questions, come see me. Come talk to me. Reach out. Because anyone who knows anything about me knows anytime you send me a message, I will always respond. And if you tell me that you that isn't the case, then obviously it's not me. And the other thing I want to point out, um, some kind of red flags that how you can tell if it's me or not. 
I will always keep things up and up and be respectful. And I will not say things that are misleading or misunderstood or anything that would be outlandish. I keep things pretty professional. I am supportive. I might tell a dad joke here and there, but I am supportive. I am honest and I am always going to tell you how it is. If someone asks me a question, I'm going to ask, answer them directly and answer them honestly. Last year, I had put a lot of work into something. And then all of a sudden, people decided to try to attack me personally and paint me in a different image. And I'm wondering how long, how many people have been trying to pretend to be me and how many people have attempted to do this in the past and how long this has been going on for. But regardless of that, I've already cleared up that whole mishap last year. And I have already proved time and time again about all of that, that you shouldn't <laughs> believe all of the fake hype. Uh, because everyone found out that, nope, I was right again, and I told the truth always. At the end of the day, I could have been upset about all that last year, and the only thing I'm really upset about isn't so much about these people who I've cut out of my life now, because frankly, if you are going to go that route, and try to force, you know, ask me to help you. And then you want to just get rid of me, all that, and take credit for that. Wait, whatever. By all means. That just means I have nothing to do with you anymore. Or my F4, I'll have nothing to do with you anymore. That's all. Because at the end of the day, I have learned that you can't make everyone happy. And I want to point out to people that if you think that people are always helping, love my support if you think that i haven't been either attacked verbally or any other ways by people you'd be wrong i've been called names i've been attacked physically i've been attacked um cyberly i've had people hack my accounts listen at the end of the day i'm still standing at the end of the day my f4o still know who i am and know what i'm about and at the end of the day, I have a voice. I'm not afraid to use it. I have a face. I'm not afraid to put out there. I have been proven people wrong my entire life, and I enjoy doing so. And at the end of the day, it comes down to the fact that, like I said to Kane, everything I have, I've earned on my own. And sad to say, I didn't have all that support from the people who were closest to me. I am happy that Kane has that. I am happy that a lot of my F4, a lot of my successful people in the world, and a lot of my friends who are F4, a lot of the people who I have so much respect for and value in, they have those supports. But guess what? I support them too. But the reason why I support them and the reason why I'm so passionate about helping others and giving back is because I know what that struggle is like when someone doesn't believe in you. And I also know that sometimes in life, it comes to that one moment of a leg up, that one opportunity. And I often said, if only I had this opportunity at this time or that time. But guess what? At the end of the day, I took the opportunities that were given to me, I made them work, and I succeeded at that. I accomplished what a lot of the things that I wanted to. I surround myself around people who are also support, also hardworking, dedicated, and go after their things, have goals in mind. I don't really associate with people who have nothing going in their life or nothing, no goals, no work ethic. Um, and a lot of people have this misunderstanding or this uh, misconception that I, because I'm nice or I seem nice, and I am nice for the most part, I'm respectful and professional. And if you ever get something from me that it sounds off and it's nothing that isn't professional or something constructive like that, then it isn't me. 
That is a fact. Um, anyone who ever takes the moment to understand that will understand what that is. Uh, I want to say thank you to everyone who has been also who has been always supportive. I want to thank everyone on Instagram, on Facebook for the last several years for always reminding me who I am and also standing by me whenever someone tries to break me down. Being seen as a leader of the F4L, because people put me in that role. Who put me in that role? My F4L worldwide put me in that, me in that role. I take that with a badge of honor and I take that with great pride. And a lot of people see being F4L as being weak and that isn't the case. Because in order to be F4L, you, you have to be strong enough to withstand and to uphold the code of the F4L. To live every single day the F4L way is a lot harder than you think it is. But it also means that I stand up for those things and I don't sit back and let things happen. I, It always hurts me when I hear about someone who gets bullied and I'm not there to protect them. And I have to question to myself, where is anybody stepping in? Today I heard Kane's story and I instantly felt remorse that I wasn't there. I don't, I didn't know Kane really like that, nor would I really be in his area of where he would be done. But that's the kind of person whom I am. That's the kind of integrity that I have. And I wanted to address that. And I wanted to make sure people know there is only one of me. And those people who are pretending to be me and who are trying to damage my reputation, let me tell you, eventually I'm going to find you. Now, not long ago, we found out someone who was helping with that element. There was someone actively spreading false things and trying to get it back at me because considering he broke copyright laws and things like that. I don't say his name publicly on this podcast because I don't want to give him any press. If you go back to the podcast where I had my cousin on here, however, not long ago, he brought him up. So if you go on to my old podcasts where Shaheen Blue came on my podcast, the only relative so far other than my family, my wife, my son, and my daughter who has ever been on the show has been my cousin Shaheen Blue. If you go back to listen to that show on Spotify, you can hear the person who lied and proof behind it considering that's on there. I can tell you this also, I have another cousin who was there filming on set who has been dying to come on here. But the reason I haven't had him on here yet is because I don't want that person being brought up all the time because I don't want that person getting any kind of credit. Having someone Google someone is giving them free press. I'm not going to do that. Just like the people who are upset with me, I have to make sure they understand it's not me you're upset with. Whoever is putting themselves out there as me, that's who you have to be upset with. And if you had reached out to me, I could have cleared that up. But it's okay. It's cool. Um, it's never You're never going to be mentioned. Um, but know that I, first and foremost, I'm sorry that someone had pretended to be me and i'm sorry whatever they did to you and i'm sorry for whatever they did um representation is a poor representation of who i am um but on the same sense i can guarantee you guarantee you that it definitely is nothing to do with me personally or me and myself because there would be absolutely no reason for anyone 
to treat me that way or for anyone to ever question something that I do or say because there is just <laughs> there's too much going in the favor of yours truly than the people who want to be me. And I do know there's a lot of heat on me. I do know a lot of people do are not happy with me. My blood family are starters of that. This podcast is like running uh, nails on a chalkboard to them because I say exactly how it is. They hate that. I talk about the, the values of the F4L. They don't understand that. And by doing that, they take it personal. And at the end of the day, that's not really what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make the world a better place. But by making the world a better place, that means I'm not going to bring and make that about you. There are certainly a number of people who I personally would love to just sit here and say all kinds of things directly to these people who have said things or annoyed me in some way. But rather than me do that, I talk in reference and I confirm my beliefs by not saying their names, but by bringing them up and telling the scenario, they know who they are, which is another reason why they're not happy with me. But you know what? They're not happy with me because the truth hurts. It's not easy to be a leader. It's a lot easier just to kind of go and conform. That's not who I am, though. To be a leader means you have to take those risks and you have to lead by example. And the example I set, I want everyone to know that you can accomplish whatever you want in life and that you can't let other people dictate to you or tell you who you are or what you're about because you yourself know what your self-worth is. That young man, Kane, is going to do huge things. Mark my words. Anyone who comes to this F4 Headquarters podcast is going to do big things. Want to know how I know that? I don't want to... Listen, I'm going to be direct with you guys. I have to take a moment to just uh, give praise for a second if I could. Uh, right after this, bear with me, folks. Hold on. We're going to go like this, and we are also going to play you guys this one right here. Enjoy this music while I get ready for what else I have to say to you. All right, that's enough of that. All right, so I'm back. I want to acknowledge some people, if I could, for a moment. And I want to see if you guys can understand kind of where I'm coming from. First and foremost, I am proud of everyone. For anyone who has ever worked hard 
and dedicated themselves to whatever their goals and dreams are, I am in full support of whatever it is you want to do. I see no difference between someone who wants to have a goal in entertainment or sports. Granted, there are different goals and different aspects of things that you want to um, aspire to do. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, what truly makes the person is the work ethic that they goes into them. And I want to acknowledge a few people. First and foremost, let's start with our newest, latest guest, Kane Lowry. That's right. I know how to say your name, bud. Kane Lowry. Lowry. I just screwed that up down there. Kane is a, I've watched Kane. I've seen him do some incredible acting work in some films and some other things. He is fantastic. I told him he had natural charisma before, and I would have said that to him live while he hadn't. I apologize. I didn't get to. But almost as soon as I was talking to him, he landed yet another gig, and I couldn't be prouder of a new friend of the F1 Headquarters podcast. And Kane, I hope you know that you now have the F4L backing you up as well. So thank you for being you. But now let's go back in time, if we could, to examine some of the other amazing people that we've had over the years. People who are real life dream masters, people who took a chance to come on this F World Headquarters podcast. And I'm going to give you a little brief update on some of them as I still talk to every single one of them because unlike so many other people who kind of bring people in just to bring them in for whatever reason, I bring people on here because I want to help make sure they succeed in their goal. And I am all for people succeeding in whatever it is they want to do. I have invited many others, but let's just chat about the people who have came here who did come here on the FL headquarters podcast okay let's go back to walker campbell a very talented singer actor model sportsman human being f world brother walker campbell the what is the epitome of the total package of what a dream master and what an f4l is I have been proud to watch Walker Campbell do what he has done. Uh, Just continues to be himself. I love his family. His family are fantastic people. His mom, one of my favorite people in the world. Walker Campbell is very successful at the things that he does, and he continues to become even better. And he also is welcome here anytime. The Menya boys, Henry and Hiro Menya. Right, upcoming, as I said, their names multiple times on this show, up and coming, rising future UFC champions. They've come on this show twice. The reason they haven't come on sooner is because they're very busy working on those goals and dreams. But guess what? But guess what? Both Henry and Hiro Menya, both singly and individually, Well, individually, since being on the podcast, have added to their championships and added to their goals and added to their legacy of wins. They are the best of Texas. They prove it every time. We are proud of both of them. Literally, they have grown on the show. Jojo, the bodybuilder, who's been on the show a couple of times, Jojo is the one person on social media who has the opportunity and the right to call himself a bodybuilder if he's under a certain age. The reason he can do that is because he has lived and is who he says he is. Jojo, the bodybuilder, has been on this show a couple of times. Now, granted, he hasn't been on since we've done this format. He will eventually. Jojo is one of the hardest working, dedicated, and and revolutionary people 
that we've had on the show. This show, he's also on Icons of the F4L. He is our first, and he is one of our first and only Grand Slam champions, which means that JoJo, the bodybuilder, has held every title that we've had. And we and JoJo's been around the block long enough to have a bunch of titles. Now we really only have uh, two sets on each show. And JoJo continues to add to that legacy. JoJo has actually competed on a bodybuilding stage and competed as a bodybuilder. That's why he gets to call himself JoJo the bodybuilder. So all those people out there who take pictures in front of your mirror, as we had with the, one of the smartest human beings I know, Jaden Brooks, we talked about it. The amount of people who just take pictures for themselves just to, I guess, show that they could take pictures themselves, but not actually have any drive of why they're doing that, other than they want to take pictures themselves. But what they don't realize, as Jaden also said, is that when they're just taking pictures in front of a camera, everyone's doing that. You're not standing out anymore by doing that. You haven't done anything differently than anybody else, your age or your bracket or whatever else. You're doing like everybody else does. Sorry, you're not standing out anymore by doing those things. Now, Jaden, who also is a fitness connoisseur, but he does it more for fitness and to be healthy, mentally, physically, emotionally. He is an entrepreneur. He is younger than most people who have no ambition to run a business, let alone anything else. And Jaden, who we've had for a few years now, we've had him come on the show. And actually, I think Jaden has a record right now for the most times coming on this show. And we're proud of him. Every time he comes here, he's always elevating himself and always evolving. Jojo the Bodybuilder is another young man who, like I said, has done amazing things, and we're proud of him. Grayson the Super Duck Russell. We had him on the show a couple of years ago, right? Uh, one of the best pure wrestling strikers I've seen. He also trains in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He is a tough young man out of Georgia, and guess what? Um, we had him on the show. He has gone on to win multiple titles since then. He's gone on to be successful in both wrestling and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Now, even when life became difficult and things hit, he showed perseverance, he showed integrity, he showed grit, and he continues to set the standard for what a real dream master is. We couldn't be prouder of the Super Duck. One of our recent guests, this is probably one of my most interesting things. Action Jackson Baker. Uh, very, very charismatic individual. We've had him on, he, we had him on the show, I think in October. In October, he was getting ready for a fight he was going to have. And apparently that fight didn't go as he had planned, but he came to the, he was, added to the icons of the F4L, our YouTube wrestling show. But since then, since that show, he continues to persevere, add to his wrestling arsenal, as well as his martial arts background. And I communicate with them all the time. And guess what? I'm very happy that Jackson is getting people almost daily calling him to sponsor him. In that amount of time, I said these names, they come on the show and they succeed. Some people come back, some people move on and do big things. And I'm proud of either one of them. I'm proud of either one of those groups. Either you come on the show and you do bigger things and you can't come back on the show because you're too big, or you come back and forth and you continue to elevate and, and evolve into becoming even more so. And going down the list of amazing people, let's not forget about the king of bling, Elijah Furton, Big E. He was on our show not long ago, too. 
was he on the line? <laughs> he was on our show, and he has since, since being on the show, he's continued to add to his legacy and add to his repertoire. On our wrestling show, he is one of the most dominant people we have. He accepts in and also believes in his in his um, abilities and his personality. He likes his gold and he likes to wear it to look good. That's a champion if I've ever seen one. He also has the work ethic, the drive, and the determination. There's a reason why he's the king of bling. And he continues to rise and become even bigger. And all of these people who I mentioned, they have all done amazing things since coming on this show. I want to point out, they've done big things before coming to this show, too. I, want, I don't want to take anything away from them. But what I'm pointing out is the fact that I recognize real talent. I recognize the real deal. And I believe in people. And I have no problem singing the praises of people who work hard and dedicate themselves how many times have I said a name, said the names of people who I know probably will never come on the show because they're either too busy or whatever. Some people are not into the talking about themselves. But guess what? That doesn't mean they don't listen, respect, or acknowledge the fact that they know that I know they're awesome. Some new people I'm going to tell you that we're trying to bring in here. Um, Jesse the Untamed. Uh, Connor Money Stellar Stellman, we're trying to bring in here. Isaiah the Natural Trena. We had the Nightmare Noah Tyndall, and he will be coming back now that we know everything works. We're going to be bringing the Redheaded Terror, Anthony Devil Week, back too for his own little segment. We're working on bringing in the Nation, Ryder Lockwood. And you know what they all have in common? Every single one of them. I said they're going to do big things. They continue to do big things. Is it a coincidence? They work hard. I acknowledge their work ethic. Some people just, you know, click a picture and whatever. I not only support them, I acknowledge them and I sing their praises. And I've been doing it longer than a lot of other people who've been sleeping under a bridge who haven't had her chance to hear these people. When it comes to Florida, how many times have you heard this name, the Adele Boys? Anthony, the Hunter. Mason, the Hammer. Ty, the Devil. Troy, the Terror Adele. All four of those brothers of the Adele Boys are all beasts in their own right, and they are the dynasty of Florida sports. The people who surround themselves with the, the with the Adele boys, who train as hard as the Adele boys, who train with them and fight with them, people like Jake the Snake LeBlanc, who, by the way, has an upcoming fight on the 13th, which is tomorrow. Let me tell you, Jake the Snake is going to show up, and Jake the Snake LeBlanc is going to show up, represent, and my I would almost put money that the snake strike, excuse me, the snake strikes and adds another W to his legacy. Again, all of these people have an open invitation here. But the reason why they haven't is, one, because they are extremely busy achieving their goals. They have some of the hardest and most... They are busy individuals. They work hard. But you know what? The reason they are as successful is because of the work that they put in. That's why I don't badger them or I don't go easy by supporting them. I don't necessarily, I, I don't mind endorsing people knowing that maybe they don't care or well, I'm not saying they don't care. They, they obviously respect the fact and they know that I respect them and they know that I support them. But I think that when it comes to, listen, when you're at that level already where you're already a dynasty, you don't need to, worry about doing things like podcasts and things like that. Um, granted, they have an open invitation here. But sometimes you don't need to talk about wh why you're awesome. Now, granted, 
Uh, I'm happy to have people reinforce why I say they're awesome. People that I've had on the show that I just mentioned, they remind people why they're awesome. They go on and they continue to show people why they're awesome. The Adele boys will continue doing that until they are all UFC champions. Jake the Snake LeBlanc, another one. Connor C.J. Stellman, another one. Jesse the Untamed Wellman Jr., another one. The Lionheart Dmitry Chernikov in the California area, another monster rising. Henry and Hiromenia, the Monsters of Texas. Ryder, the Nation Lockwood. Big E, the King of Bling, Elijah Burton. These are the epitome of what the future of UFC is. You know what? The outlook is perfect. Then you have Noah the Nightmare Tyndall. You have the Red Hat Terry Anthony Demoweeks. You have... Isaiah, the natural Trenya. So many monsters of the world who are future locker room leaders, future UFC champions. I got news for you. I have said the names multiple times. How many times have I said, in order to be the man, you must beat the man? That's an old wrestling term, granted. But in order to prove that you are the best, you need to take on the best. And I got to tell you, there is an upcoming fight that I personally am excited for, but also I am concerned, not concerned in the bad sense, but because I can't pick a winner. I have to be neutral because I have so much respect for both athletes. Here's what I know at the end of the day. That is the epitome of what a dream fight is. And that fight that is coming up is going to feature the best of the UK, the best of the US. But guess what? They can only be one best in the world. And if the nightmare Noah Tyndall is number one in the UK, Isaiah, the natural Trina, represents the United States. Both young men, hardworking, dedicated, hardcore, both our future UFC champions, both, both are beasts. Both are icons of the F4L. Both are the leaders of both of their worlds. They are going to have a real life fight. This is the epitome of what a dream fight is. This is, well... In hindsight, in the in the youth MMA world, I don't know if there is another dream fight out there. I mean, I personally could think of some that would be pretty good. This is something I couldn't even book. They did this in real life. In all honesty, no matter who wins that fight, they are both warriors. They are both dream masters they are both icons of the f4l and at the end of the day they are both the best of their divisions and the best of their worlds and whoever emerges at the end of that fight between noah the nightmare tyndall and isaiah the natural trainer whoever walks out of that will be the best in the world the other person is going to be the person who's going to challenge that person again. I guarantee you on that. They heard and listened to what I say. Because in order to be the best, you need to challenge the best. You don't become the best of the world because someone says you are or because you tell people you are. Noah the Nightmare Tyndall had a fight not long ago that everyone talked and raved about this other person who, by the way, I've never said anything about on this show because I don't see it. I don't believe the hype. Noah the Nightmare Tyndall, I believe the hype. And when I heard these two people were going to fight and I heard they were going to have a match, I got to say I was excited because I knew what the outcome would be. I knew that the nightmare would humble the beast. Oh, sorry, the mini beast. And you know what? Guess who was right again? 
I I can't wait to get Noah on the show again so he can tell people about that particular fight. I got to say, I saw some footage from there, and he came in there with all of these fans thinking that they had a real champion, thinking they had this thing in the well in the bag. But guess what? They believed the they believed the hype. Noah didn't believe didn't do the hype thing. He went with the real thing. And it goes to show you, sometimes nightmares are better than beasts. Um, and some nightmares come true, and that's exactly what happened. Um, you know what? I'm hoping that after that, maybe the young man learned some humble, learned to be humble after that. I don't know, because I haven't heard much about him since, because the nightmare made him humble. Is exactly what he's done to many others. Now, you heard Noah on the show here not long ago. He was on here during our watch along. And he said he's had some, he had a loss here and there, but he doesn't let that hold him back. He comes back and continues to add to his titles. Now, Isaiah, the natural trina, is planning on coming on here, and eventually he will. I think it would be interesting to see what would happen if I could bring the two of them on at the same time. I am neutral to both. That is going to be tough. But I might have to be the person who wants to sh- see what happens if that happens. My mind is going because I think I might be able to do that. But anyway, we're going off on a tangent here. The point of this is people listen to the show. And despite the fact how many people want to deny it or not listen to it or not acknowledge it, the proof is in the pudding. The proof is all over the place. When people, another example is the Super Duck Grayson Russell one time needed a fight. And I said, in order to prove that you are the best, you need to challenge the best. And when I said that, you know, the Super Duck needed a fight, go see him. The Super Duck got a fight. Someone went to go see him. That's how it works, folks. And I say this again to anyone else out there. In order to really get what you want in life, you need to put yourself out there. You need to put the work in. What Kane did tonight is something that actors do and what people who want to be successful do. They network and they get themselves out there because that is how you get places. That one opportunity, that one appearance can open up your world to other things. After this appearance, heck, I might be, if I have something in the works, I might be willing to call up Kane Lowry to give him that opportunity. In fact, I might just have something for him. But he might be too busy doing the movies that he's already succeeded in, and that's okay with me. Because that is his passion, and that's what he's meant to do. So, um, I have mentioned the names of other people on this show, and they've gone on to do some big things, and I can't be prouder of all of them. I am proud of every single one of them. And I'm hoping that in 2024, even more people can be woken up to these amazing human beings who I call dream masters and dream warriors, icons of the F4L. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think there's much else to be said here. So allow me, if you would, or not me, but allow my good friend Bertram to play you guys this tribute. So to everyone out there who works hard, who has dedicated themselves to a goal or dream, to everyone who's come on this F4L Headquarters podcast, To everyone who has gone on to succeed, Bertram, play the music to show camaraderie and to show our appreciation.
Excuse me, folks. And that will do it here from the FOL Headquarters podcast. To everyone out there, may all your dreams come true. Enjoy your weekend, everyone. Peace.